Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. And welcome back to this third session of the Future of Finance series by the International Institute for Sustainable Development and the China Council for International Cooperation on Environment and Development. Very excited for today's session because today we're diving into gender lens investing, which for those of you who have been following all the sessions will note that this was one of the trends and things to watch that was put forward in our first session. So I'm very much looking forward to the discussion today. My name is Kaylee Taylor. I'm an advisor here at IISD where I work primarily on sustainable development goals and in particular on the link between the SDGs and finance as well as community building efforts. And that brings me to my next point, which is that this uh, initiative or this this series is part of the Building Bridges community and Building Bridges is an initiative that's focused on bringing the international development and sustainable development community closer to the finance industry so that we can materially drive more capital to sustainable development, human rights and other important issues of our time. So we're very happy to have this event be part of that community today. Uh, we're also on Twitter. If you'd like to follow along or add to the conversation there, it's hashtag future of finance. And that's what we've been using all week. So you might be able to also look back at some of the discussion that's happened in our previous two sessions. This, as I mentioned, is the last session. And so the next piece will be that we will be summarizing these and releasing blog posts and also the recordings. So if you missed anything, don't worry, there will be a recording uh, where you can look back. We have just a fantastic group of speakers uh, today. I'm so excited to hear about their perspective on gender lens investing. We have uh, David Yuzoki from IISD, who is our sustainable finance lead and our senior advisor. And he's gonna be providing us with the overall context. And then we're gonna move to a panel with Suzanne Beagle, who's the co-founder of Gender Smart and Catalyst at, at Large and Christine Roddy, who is the executive director of the Alpha Mundi Foundation. We also have Tim Raji from Alpha Mundi Group, who is the CEO, but we are just uh, having a little bit of connection issues. Uh, he's currently on a uh, business trip in Kenya. So let's see how we do. We might be able to have both of them speak to us. And then we have Frederic Pinglo uh, from uh, Schneider Electric, who is the group sustainability performance director. So thank you again so much for being here. I'm really looking forward to the conversation today uh, to now pass it over to David, who is going to give us the overall context of gender lens investing. So David, I won't speak any longer. It's now the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much, Kelly, And thank you very much for all for, for attending. So I'm gonna give you a, like an introduction about gender lens investing in general, you know, focusing a little bit on the, on the definition also on where we are today and also where we could be uh, in the next couple of years. So what is gender lens investing? And here I'm gonna use uh, the definition from Suzanne's Gender Smart Investing Initiative. Um, so they, they, they define gender lens investing as the use of capital to both generate financial return and also advance gender equality. Uh, gender lens investing can actually also refer to the integration of gender analysis throughout the investment cycle, such as sourcing or investments, for example, or financial analysis. Um, so how does actually all this look like in case of an equity fund, for example, just to, so just to give you another, like a practical example. So of course, funds can have different levels of ambition uh, in gender diversity. And, and, and use different gender KPIs, which are normally de de determined by the investment mandate. Uh, but for example, they could apply gender lens in how they define the investment universe. So in this case, as an example could be uh, for, for the gender criteria, uh, that the fund is only allowed to invest into companies that have at least 40% female representation at the board level and also uh, at the C level, so like CEOs, CFOs, CEOs, for example. On the next slide, uh, I, um, I will try to answer the question, why gender lens investing? So why is it important? Why are we talking about this here today? So first, um, achieving gender equality 
is essential for a prosperous and a sustainable world as it affects so many aspects of sustainable development. And um, unfortunately, actually, most people do not realize uh, that the most pressing environmental and social challenges of our time impact women disproportionately. So for example, women uh, are particularly vulnerable to climate change uh, as it can worsen existing gender inequalities. Also, uh, gender inequality is a key driver of, of, uh, of poverty, while it is also one of the, the most common forms of discrimination. So for this reason, I believe that addressing this issue should be a priority, especially for investors uh, with a sustainability mandate. So having said all this, the good news is that actually gender lens investing can even have a positive financial impact. So, so companies with a gender diverse workforce are likely to outperform their peers. Um, I want to show on the next slide, I want to show you some numbers on what the business case is for uh, gender lens investing. So research shows that companies uh, with uh, gender diverse boards are 28% more likely to outperform their peers. Also, uh, gender diversity is also uh, important in executive teams um, uh, who can actually have a positive impact. Uh, so by, by increasing the chance of outperformance by 25%. And in case of venture capital and private equity funds, uh, they can have like 20% higher returns uh, with gender diverse investment teams uh, as per the research uh, I could find. So on the next slide, uh, I just want to kind of give you an idea of where gender lens investing is today in terms of size. So um, as we discussed in the first future finance session on Tuesday, sustainable investing has experienced an impressive growth in recent years. So reaching about like 40 trillion US dollars in assets under management last year. At the same time, uh, only a fraction of this amount, so about like 17, 17 billion US dollar has gone into gender lens investing. So there's clearly there's a long way to go before it catches up with other popular sustainable investing themes such as climate, for example. Uh, but the good news is that actually investor demand for gender smart investment opportunities has increased considerably in recent years. We have seen a wide range of gender-focused financial products emerging across uh, most of the asset classes, such as gender lens funds, exchange-traded funds, certificates of deposit, gender bonds, private equity, and debt funds with a gender focus. So on the next slide, I just want to talk a little bit about how to scale up financing towards gender ob objectives. So why are I I actually expect gender lens investing to continue its rapid growth in the coming years. Um, but financing towards gender objectives uh, could be scaled up significantly if gender indicators were integrated in all sustainable finance instruments and investment funds by default, um, and irrespective of the thematic focus. So for example, a fund uh, focusing on climate would also need to inc incorporate uh, gender considerations in how it invests. So this is actually an area that IIS is working on, on currently. So, so uh, again, in the previous section, we mentioned that assets under management with an ESG mandate are expected to reach about like 160, 170 trillion US dollars by 2036. Uh, so it, this gives an idea about the size of the opportunity to scale up financing for gender diversity if gender indicators were to be integrated in all sustainable finance instruments. So how would all this look like in practice? And, and this is something I'm happy to talk about maybe during the discussion if, if you have time, uh, but also actually I've written several articles and other publications that are coming out on this topic very soon. So, uh, so keep an eye on our website or the IISD Twitter or my LinkedIn account if, if, if this is something of interest for you. So there are of course some challenges uh, and that, that needs to be thought through and addressed. Um, but I believe considering the societal and of course now we know the financial benefits of gender equality, I think it would be worthwhile. And, and honestly, at the end of the day, 
I wonder how can an ESG fund uh, be considered sustainable if it ignores whether its investments are addressing the needs of the other 50% of our society? So that's a question. So thank you very much and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks so much, David, for that really strong picture of where we're at right now. I think for me, it's quite shocking to see the these numbers of you know 40 trillion in sustainable investing but low billions uh in terms of, of gender lens investing when this is such a, a crucial dimension and so i'm very much looking forward to speaking to our other panelists today our panelists today who are going to help us uh, unpack how uh, they're approaching this what they're seeing as some of the instruments and ways of, of tangibly addressing gender lens investment. And so I'm going to just stop. We don't need any more slides because we're just going to now be hearing from um, our panelists. So I'm going to first go to Suzanne. Uh, and Suzanne is, is a trailblazer in this space. And I'm really happy we could have you here today. Uh, thank you so much for the Gender Smart Initiative and um, all the work that you're doing around driving capital to uh, SDG5 and to women. And so my question for you is, what are the big developments you're seeing in this space? And what do we need to do to scale up so we're not in that billions number when the rest is in trillions? Um, so over to you, Su Suzanne, and thanks again for being here. Thanks, Kaylee, and thanks so much uh, for that introduction, David. So, um, so my context is that I represent a community of over 2,500 investment allocators and decision makers um, from around the world, 53 countries, um, who've come together in the context of Gender Smart Investing Summit, but also all year long to really move, unlock um, Gender Smart Capital at scale. So we are talking a lot, we just finished a two week summit about what is it gonna take to scale this up? Um, and one of the things is really to be clear, as we heard in the first seminar that you did, that we can be starting with gender, leading with gender, or we can be really looking first at climate, looking at health, looking at other themes, and then bringing in, as David just mentioned, gender as a core theme and a core factor of analysis to be smarter investors. Um, and there is also an element of uh, really being able to say you can be starting with the gender leaders but also you can be having a transition strategy just as you would in climate, um, where we can say we're looking directly for climate smart investments in the first place, or we can be doing things to really dramatically increase the, the climate imp uh, uh, impact um, of our investments. Um, so there's a transition strategy picture. Um, there's a way to really think about where we are today, but then also projecting into the future, what do we believe the world will look like and how do we think about where gender and broader forms of diversity are going to be at play. Um, and when you talk about the number 17 billion, that is the intentional gender lens strategies, where they're named strategies, but we've got all the possibility of the, the funds and the vehicles and the infrastructure projects which are building gender in and gender integration in to the picture. Part of what people need to know is that this is not niche in terms of who's acting on this. So it's the UBS, Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, Credit Suisse, Goldman, City, the big names, the development finance institutions have come in um, to play a really major role. GPIF, I know we have people from Asia on this call, the largest pension fund in the world, putting 2.9 billion into one gender lens fund just in December as a signal to say, if we're not investing in what the world looks like, um, then we're really missing something. And the basis on which they made that decision, which is my first key point here is that they really use the risk frame. Um, thinking about opportunity of gender lens investing is one thing, but to say, what is the risk of not paying attention in our portfolios to gender factors? And where are the blind spots that we're, that we're going to have if we're not looking at the reputational risk, if we're not looking at the um, financial risk, by not looking at talent, looking at markets, looking at who understands products and the features that people are really looking for, looking at supply chains, um, even marketing, um, that was one of the things that they talked about at the summit that we just had. Um, where are you really um, working with your team to understand what those risk factors are? Data, we talked quite a lot about data, and I think that's been a theme through all of your um, seminars. We have good data, as with climate, but we're on a pathway um, to needing more consistent, reliable, transparent 
up-to-date data. Um, and David, I'm glad you brought that out, that um, we've got to both recognize that we have enough data as we did in climate to get started, but then to really come together to, to be sure that we have the right data for the right vehicles and the right instruments uh, in the right places. The power of this intersectionality of saying it's climate and gender, healthcare and gender, education and gender, housing, and the built environment, um, that this really comes out everywhere we are. And um, the fact that we now have standards and frameworks and um, opportunities for doing uh, measurement in a harmonized way, I think is absolutely critical. And on the climate side, we've got this elegance of net zero. Uh, and we asked ourselves in our recent summit, what's the, what's the gender lens investing uh, equivalent of net zero? Can we get people aligned around that? Um, we'll go Climate finance didn't start with a net zero target. We, you know, we've been at this for 20 years. So on the gender side, um, there are many, many dimensions that we're looking at. And we have to really say, we're going to be on a similar journey to say what, what matters in companies, what matters in projects, both to what matters to women, what matters to businesses, what matters to financial outcomes. And so we're definitely on a path and needing to really collaborate about that. We've been thinking about whether TCFD could offer a framework that would be useful, thinking about where does gender lens investing come out in your strategy, in your governance? How does it manifest in your strategy? What does it look like from a risk management perspective? And in the metrics and targets, you could, you could put gender into TCFD, or you could actually have a parallel um, that is around that. And I think that's worth thinking about. We talked a lot about changing who is in power in decision-making. Quite honestly, if we're really gonna make this transition, we need to be thinking about who is allocating the capital and only globally 1.3% of assets are managed by women and people of color. Um, and that is just, uh, just sit and think about that for a minute. If we do not have women and men in, uh, uh, in acquisition and decision-making about how capital is flowing, we are not gonna get to the numbers we're looking for and the quality. And we're not just talking about counting women on a board or an investment committee. We're also thinking about how do we help people shift their processes? And David talked about that um, and really um, improving the capacity of, our, of the investment community to understand what this looks like. Uh, there's a broader definition of diversity at play here too. So we're talking about women, but we're also talking about people of color and um, racial and ethnic diversity and other forms of diversity in the picture. And right now, because of Black Lives Matter and the global movement that this has kicked off, um, we're thinking about, um, and investors globally are thinking about that very much. We're really looking at structures and thinking the structures that we have, are they fit for purpose? Yes, we've got private equity and you know private debt and public markets vehicles uh, and bond structures that people are familiar with. And it's very helpful to work with familiar structures as a pathway to scale but we also need to really look at are we are these existing structures serving us and where might we really need to shift um, I think the last thing I want to talk about is the power of partnerships and commitments so uh, we saw such ex and we're seeing in this space such exciting collaborations the 2x collaborative which is the network of DFIs development finance institutions that have come together to establish a set of criteria, to establish a set of ambitious targets, to say we look, need to be looking at leadership, ownership, uh, where, where are the employment opportunities, where is the opportunities and products and services, how does this look if you're going through a financial institution that's doing gender lens investing or a private equity fund or in a direct investment. So collaborations like 2x uh, collaborative are really exciting, but also collaborations between corporates and DFIs and banks uh, and, and foundations. And so we have, a we have a lot of those in space where uh, the, you know, uh, Merck, for, Merck came together with USDFC, Credit Suisse and USAID to launch an initiative around investing in child and maternal health in Africa, $50 million, but coming from this interesting constellation of partners. So much of this comes down to leadership, to asking better questions about who is doing the investing, where are women in the picture, what is our investment process, to see this as systemic, and to really seeing where the opportunities are for collaboration. And I'll just stop there. Thank you so much for that, Suzanne. That was a fantastic picture of, I love this idea of the transition strategy and you know where we 
were in climate maybe a decade ago that you know we can we can build off of that and learn from that but also this more integrated approach and you you've put me at ease about that that uh, billions number because as you said that that's more uh, what's the the targeted pieces versus those where it might already be integrated so thank you so much for that i think that provided a super great picture and i'm seeing lots of questions come in already which we'll get to in just a second I'm now going to move over to, we're going to try Tim and Christine will be able to back him up if, uh, let's see how we do with our technology. Alpha Mundi uh, has, has been pushing for gender lens investing here in Switzerland. It's been a leader on this. And I'm just very curious to know what, what you're doing specifically on gender lens investing, uh, why you're interested in this and what the business case for you is to to take this lens and this approach. Sure, hi everyone. Um, my name is Christine Roddy, thanks Tim. I joined the Alpha Mini family about two years ago. And for those that aren't as familiar with us, we are a Swiss-based impact investing advisory firm that is currently managed to, managing two gender lens funds that are investing across sectors in East Africa and Latin America. Um, and I think Kaylee, your first question is around why are we interested in this? Um, I think for a few reasons, Tim was just starting to talk about how we truly believe that balanced teams make better teams, both within our organization at Alpha Mundi and also with our investees. Um, so Alpha Mundi is, you know, we have balanced teams at pretty much every level of the decision making process um, for the investment life cycle. Um, I think a second important reason for us is that we understand that supporting women and girls is a truly essential component to our mission um, to reduce poverty. Uh, I think that also, you know, in terms of looking historically at our impact data, we realized that the impact metrics we weren't we were collecting weren't really telling a full story of our true impact, both at the portfolio company and our kind of client and beneficiary levels. Um, so I think that you know, in terms of looking at our approach, um, we recognize that we have a unique role to play as capital providers in terms of, you know, the role of influence that we can have at portfolio companies. Um, and so, you know, we recognize that and we, we think that promoting gender equality um, across our portfolio and encouraging women at all levels of the organization um, is the best role that we can play as an impact investor. Um, and in terms of what we're doing uh, as an investor, we've officially incorporated a gender diagnostic assessment as a component of our due diligence process about two years ago. And this has yielded really important insights for us as we're evaluating companies as prospective investees. And separately on the foundation side, we have started to provide um, what we like to call business first gender smart technical assistance interventions. Um, so we're doing this with about a third of our portfolio right now. Um, and the goal of these interventions, and I'm happy to elaborate on what this looks like further, but the goal is to try to work with companies over a 12 to 24 month process um, to ultimately encourage them to institutionalize gender parity as kind of, or gender equity as a core business principle akin to kind of ESG. Um, so, you know, thank you for hosting us and happy to elaborate further. And um, Tim, do you want to, I don't know if your connectivity issues are working, but do you want to elaborate on our gender lens initiative in Switzerland specifically? No, go ahead, Christine, for us, please. Um, sure. So, so very briefly, um, Tim is lead and our team in Alpha Mindy in Switzerland is spearheading an initiative in Geneva um, to help kind of build the business case and mar mapping and to start mapping um, the, the market for, for gender lens investing products and opportunities in Switzerland explicitly. Um, and so we're happy to elaborate on this further. Thanks, thanks for Dean. And one maybe just kind of prodding question because I, I, I really like this part of that you're kind of living it with your own team and that this is part of your mission and an essential part of your mission on the business side. And you mentioned that in Switzerland, you're building the business case. Are you know? Are you seeing this business case in your investments for the gender lens? I mean, you, you mentioned your impact data, but are you are you already seeing evidence of this? 
Yeah, I think we're absolutely seeing evidence of this across our portfolio. And when we talk about building the business case, I would be amiss to not mention um, our flagship field building effort, um, which is called G-Search, or the Gender Smart Enterprise Assistance Research Coalition. Forgive me, I know that's a mouthful. Um, but essentially, this is a consortium of six like-minded impact investors. That in This includes, obviously, Alpha Mundi, Acumen, Root Capital, CIF, among others, that are committed to building this business case for fund managers to invest with a gender lens in emerging markets. Um, so G-Search, you know, spanning these six impact investors, we have 30 participating um, SMEs or enterprises that are both portfolio companies and pipeline companies as well. Um, and we are in the process, we've brought on a research partner, the William Davidson Institute that's affiliated with the University of Michigan to help us develop research frameworks to, let, to collect social and financial performance data coming from these like business first, gender smart, equity interventions um, across our portfolio. And um, our, our, we just launched our first learning product, which I'll drop in the chat a couple weeks ago at Suzanne's Gender Smart Summit. Um, and in the next couple of months, we're hoping to share some preliminary findings um, based on the data coming out of, uh, of this work. Perfect. Thanks so much, Christine. Um, this is really exciting to see all the work you're doing also in the community and with other investors, because I think you know, uh, there's a lot to win across the industry by working together on these things as well. So thank you so much for that. I'm now going to move over to Frederick from Schneider Electric. And Schneider has recently launched its first sustainability linked bond. And it has three KPIs, but one of them is specifically gender linked. So my questions to you, Frederick, are, first of all, why did you decide on this gender related KPI in the context of the sustainability linked bond? And what is your process for capturing data and measuring your progress on, I mean, all the KPIs, but specifically the gender one. So I'll pass it over to you now. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Carrie. Can you hear me okay? All right, excellent. Uh, yeah, thank you for having me and having Schneider represent the private sector, I guess, in this in this panel. Uh, always, always happy to share what we are trying to achieve uh, at Schneider. And maybe to start, uh, telling everybody on the on the on the call today who is Schneider Electric. You might not all be familiar uh, with us. We are a French uh, company located in more than 100 countries in the world. We have uh, around 130,000 people uh, as employees in the world. 33% uh, of them are women today. Uh, we are focused on two um, on, on two industries: uh, energy management first and industrial automation uh, and we make around 26 billion euros revenue uh, each year. Uh, the particularity of Schneider is that we are you know positioning ourselves on both sides of the equation uh, regarding sustainability. Uh, the main one which is our answer to climate change we've talked about it earlier but that's our business that's what we do uh, to provide solutions um, to companies to fight climate change reduce their CO2 emissions, improve their energy efficiency and so on, but then in the same time to be exemplary and a role model in our own um, scope and not only regarding climate and the environment, but a holistic uh, and I'd say ecosystemic view of what is sustainability, right? So it's not just environment of, and climate, but it's a lot of topics um, like uh, ethics, human rights, gender diversity, um, and, and many other things. And uh, what we do at Schneider for quite a long time is to really take this holistic view and address sustainability as um, all of these topics and all of our stakeholders to be leading my example, to be the best partner for our customers and also the most attractive for our employees and of course, uh, investors. So uh, before we get to the uh, sustainability link bond, which is actually the, uh, the, the achievement of 15 years of progress in the field of sustainability for the company, um, what we've started to do 15 years ago is to think how could we match our sustainability performance across all these topics that are very different uh, and, and hardly comparable. How could we give ourselves a single score uh, out of 10 that would encompass all of these uh, objectives and progresses and so on. So we figured, okay, we're, we're going to build every three to five years a plan 
based on materiality analysis. So we are consulting all our internal and external stakeholders. We say, okay, these are the, the key pillars for our strategy. And now let's develop concrete plans and concrete programs to address them in within three to five years. Because you know, ideas and ambitions are one thing, but concrete action and programs are something else. So this is what how we've been working. And then every quarter we publish together with our financial results, the sustainability result of what we call the Schneider sustainability impact, which is uh, that tool. Uh, and you know, we convert the performance of each KPI in the program in a score out of 10, and that gives us an overall performance. And then in 2014, we figured, okay, how could we further embed these performance into um, incentives, for example, for our employees? Um, and what we did is that we used that score uh, and we linked it to the short-term incentive plans for our employees. Today, it's 20% of the collective share for 60,000 employees in the group, including to, to the highest level of the company. Um, and you know, it's a performance that depends on the, the progress across several topics of sustainability. One of them being, for example, diversity. In the previous program, we wanted to deploy in all countries a process to address gender pay gap issues. Uh, that's something, it's not exactly what we address here, but so, that's something also linked to, to diversity. Um, so we've also audited all that every year because it's very important to bring um, robust, robustness and transparency to, to that process. Um, and eventually when the opportunity or the option of having, of linking sustainability performance to a financial instrument and this convertible sustainability link bond, you know, the, the, the idea actually was ideal for Schneider because uh, how it works is, uh, okay, we are going to uh, cut in for money. Uh, and then within five years, depending on our achievements on sustainable goals, then, you know, we'd have to pay you a premium uh, or not. Um, and so we thought, well, we already have the tool uh, and the process to do that. Uh, we could, like other companies, just link into a climate goal, but that's not in our in our culture at Schneider. That's not how we address sustainability. Uh, we need to have more. Um, and today, just a couple of months ago, we launched our new 2025 ambitions. Uh, in these ambitions, we have six pillars, which are climate, uh, resources, which is mostly linked to a, a circular economy, uh, equality, uh, trust, generations, and the local aspect. Um, and so we thought, okay, all 11 KPIs that we have within these is too much, probably, and it's going to be too hard to understand, to, to figure really the link uh, and everything. So let's pick three, uh, one on climate and the CO2 savings we allow for our customers, because that's the, the value proposition of the company, very important. The second one on diversity, that's or one of our, our core value to be inclusive as a company. So gender equality is one of the aspects, uh, as you mentioned, there is also LGBT, uh, ethnical, uh, pay equity, et cetera, et cetera, access to education and so on. Uh, and then the last one, which is a specificity of Schneider, which is training underserved people in, in energy management. So uh, we have something related to climate and customers, diversity in our operations, and then youth, and education and our communities. Uh, and the target we have, uh, and Kelly, maybe I don't have much time left, I'm not sure, uh, but the idea is that, okay, we could have one KPIs, which is to improve the overall gender balance in the group over the 140,000 people, but that's not how you solve it. It's not like you, need, you fire men and then you hire women and that's how you solve the balance. No, it takes time. Uh, so what we decided is to have three KPIs. First, to have 50% of women at hiring. Today, it's 40%. Second, to raise to 40% uh, women in frontline managers. So let's say further up in, in the company. And then 30% at leadership level. So basically, we want to, in, this, in an incremental way, uh, add 10, 10 points, let's say, to women at every stage of, of the company. And then eventually uh, we'll progress uh, and, and improve there. Wow, that, that's fascinating. 
I mean, the size and scale of what you're working on is, is huge. And of course, you know, we're talking mostly about finance and, and finance investing companies. So it's so interesting to hear about how you manage this in such a massive organization. And, and thank you so much for explaining that to us. I think it provides a, a look at the scale and the thought that needs to go into tangibly making these strategies a reality. I just wanna remind the, uh, the attendees that there is a, a Q and A and you can upvote different uh, questions. So please uh, feel free to do that. I'm going to ask uh, just a question first while, while everyone is upvoting that's around um, how we integrate gender considerations into sustainable finance instruments in other dimensions of finance. This is kind of mentioned that, you know, there's the, you can have just a, a gender related instrument or product, but where it really will take off is in this mainstreaming across all these different ones. So maybe I'll, I'll first give this question to David and then Suzanne. What does this tangibly look like to integrate a gender consideration into a sustainable finance instrument? Just to give our audience a sense of, of what goes into that now that we kind of see how companies handle that on their side. Yeah, so thank you, Kelly. So um, it actually depends on, you know, you know, like what type of instrument. So like the answer could, it's actually could be quite broad, but I mean, if I focus on maybe, for example, funds and bonds, maybe that's, that just covers some of the biggest asset classes when it comes to, uh, gender integration. So, so cu currently many ESG uh, compliant uh, funds apply uh, some form of negative screens to exclude controversial sectors and um, and companies from the investment universe, such as tobacco, coal, weapon manufacturing. So basically, I believe that a similar approach could be taken for gender. Uh, when companies that simply do not meet and do not have a minimum level of gender performance should be excluded automatically from the investment universe of these funds. So that could be basically one way to do it for the funds. And concerning uh, bonds, like sustainability bonds, uh, like, like uh, and sustainable bonds, I mean like green bonds, social bonds, transition bonds, sustainable link bonds. Um, we have developed a handbook uh, together with Wilson Young and IMC worldwide that also has a chapter on how integrating gender considerations in bond frameworks could be done in practice. So this, this handbook is gonna be published uh, soon. So, keep, so again, keep an eye on this on our website and Twitter. Uh, but in short, so in case of green bonds, how, uh, you know, like the bond frameworks defines the list of green project categories where the bond proceeds can go. And there is no possibility of having, for example, social project category for gender there. So in this case, gender considerations uh, must be integrated in how the projects are selected. So in other words, in the eligibility criteria. So in case of a sustainability link bonds, is, uh, in, in case of sustainable link bonds, uh, we just heard from Frederick how this would be done. So it would be like a second set of uh, KPIs for gender. Thanks. And as I pass it over to Suzanne, maybe if you could also help us to understand when you say a gender consideration, I, I, we've talked a little bit about leadership and in the workforce, how does it play in, you know, companies that actually serve women, you know, more as the consumers or uh, in, in local communities? Are there considerations for all different types of how women are included? And uh, if you could, if you could also help us understand that a little bit as you respond. Okay, so thank you. And David, I'm sure you're a lot more to add about this. So the first is, yeah, to get specific, which women are we talking about in which places for what kind of instrument, you know, what are, what are the objectives that we're really aiming for? So if I'm looking at a hydro power project in Nepal, you know, it may not be about the consumer product. It may be, it's going to be about employment. And I love the specificity that Frederic just shared about recruitment, retention, advancement, sort of training, access to, uh, again, what is the percentage of uh, recruitment that needs to be gender balanced and then what needs to happen in terms of the actual hiring and then actual promotion advancement access to resources, right? So getting that specific. Um, we, so it's about defining your strategy and figuring out what are the right targets. If it's uh, about access to capital for women SMEs uh, in, uh, in a particular geography, then you wanna say, where's the ownership? 
Um, and where's the ownership, where's the leadership, and does it have to be 100%? Can it be 50%? Can it be 30%? You've got to be able to really have a set of targets that people can really agree on. If you're thinking about customers, then you'd want to look at product set and say, what? and there's a, quite a good debate about this, what, is it what percentage of revenue that the company generates is for products that disproportionately are targeting women, percentage of the product sale? Um, you know, how do you really want to count that? But the key is to say, does the company from a process standpoint understand the gender differentiated needs of men versus women? Um, and are they thinking about the feature set, the products, the services, how they're marketed, how they're sold, how they're serviced um, in a customer centric way? So that if there are, for example, really different needs that women have from men in transportation, in energy, in an off-grid energy product, um, that people that somebody is being really responsive, and what are the process things that you could look at? To, to really understand, are they demonstrating that? And then of course, how does it come out in sales and how does it come out in customer retention? And by the way, net, you know, net promoter score uh, from women, do they recommend that product? So you can think about those kinds of things. So we, we've got to be able to have sex disaggregated data to understand male versus female preferences. We've got to be able to have people who understand how to analyze the data uh, and really make good business decisions around that. Um, and pick the right KPIs um, and create then repeatable structures for these different kinds of vehicles. And yeah, what it's gonna look like in a PE fund versus a, a debt fund uh, that is, um, uh, you know, got particular flavor of capital versus a, a public markets fund is gonna, is gonna look very different. So you've gotta be fit for purpose um, for what you're really, uh, really designing for. Great, thank you for that, Suzanne. I think that really helped to make it more clear for me on, and I, I then think probably others in the audience as well on, on what this looks like tangibly. Christine, there's a there's a whopper of a question of a question in the Q and A. I'm going to throw to you to see what you think, uh, and maybe also a couple other people. And then there's a couple of specific questions for Schneider that I'll I'll come to right after that. So, what could be the impact of regulations imposing a minimum percentage of board members? Uh, that are women or people of color. Uh, so I guess they're asking what could be the impact, which I think is hard for any person to know. So maybe, do you think regulation could help in this space? Um, or are you seeing it more as a, a stick or, or as a carrot and encouragement? So I'm just curious what you think on that side of things. That is definitely a whopper of a question. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure I'm best put position to, answer it. I mean, I think that um, as, as Suzanne mentioned, like specificity and context here matters. And I'm not sure that setting targets um, for, for leadership or governance composition is appropriate in every context. Um, I think that raising awareness and, and incentives around this can be very compelling. Um, I know that in Europe, I think there's pending legislation to help tie some uh, CEO performance around ESG targets. Um, I think there's a, a lot of, um, there's a big brand equity question, um, uh, which I think a lot of top companies in the US are recognizing around how diverse is your you know, company in and of itself and, and its leadership as well um, when it comes to gender representation and, and other areas of representation. Um, so I think that there can be a concern, concern around distortion um, and, or of incentives on this. Um, and, and also I think we wanna be careful around not checking any boxes. Um, and so I think, you know, it's my, press, my personal preference would be that just, you know, companies and organizations recognize that the same way that we have at Alpha Mundi that balanced teams truly make better teams um, at every level of the decision-making process. Um, but I, I'd be curious to hear what Suzanne's take is on this. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I think before I pass it to Frederick with the Schneider specific questions, if anyone wants to weigh in on this very philosophical or kind of a question about approach, uh, I'll just pause and let, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to just say that I think we need both. We need private market action and people just to realize that gender smart investing is just smart investing and that, that making these changes is good for business. Uh, but then the regulators can play an enormous role. And pay equity is a really good example where people said, oh, we could never collect that kind of data. We could never share that kind of data. And then the UK put in a pay equity law. And lo and behold, companies were able to share that data. People said we could never look at slavery and trafficking in supply chains. And then the Modern Slavery Act was passed. 
uh, again, where the regulator came in and said, we are, we are gonna demand that people uh, really act on this. And so in terms of governance, I think we need a combination um, as Christine was just saying, sometimes it's going to be the right thing to do to say, and I love, in, you know, Iceland put in an, uh, an incentive and a, and a stick to say $500 a day, you're fined if you don't have at least, you know, some number of women on your board. Uh, and, you know, let's, let's see what that does. But I think the bigger impact is going to be just for people to recognize that at this point, employees and the talent who you want to attract, customers, partners, investors are using this as a, as a set of metrics. They're looking at your company um, and making decisions. And so I think we, I think we need both. And then I think that and, and then, I, you know, yeah, that's it. But I was gonna say, I think that's a perfect message for this quite diverse audience as well, because everyone has a role to play, whether you're sitting in a, you know, a seat of government uh, or, or you're in a financial institution or you're in one of these companies as uh, Frederick is and, and trying to figure out how the process for this, which leads me to my next question, which is in the chat around who is measuring and assessing if Schneider has achieved its KPIs. I think people are quite interested in understanding the objectiveness and the, the impact measurement side of this and who's involved. Do you get this audited? Do you, how, how do you go about ensuring that the impact um, that and the KPIs that you're hitting are actually what, what's being achieved. Thank you, that's an excellent question actually. Um, so we have several, several ways. Uh, first of all, when we did the, uh, uh, the sustainability link bond, um, the, uh, While well, you have a whole framework that is there uh, that you need to respect in order to be eligible for, for calling it a sustainability link bond. And that's audited by a, a, a second party opinion. Uh, for Schneider, it was Visio Eris. Uh, you might know the, uh, the rating agent, the, the French rating agency. Um, and so they were assessing the level of ambition. They were assessing the, the materiality of the um, KPIs. Uh, the relevance uh, as well, and we passed all of those uh, criteria. And, and actually, that report is available on our uh, website uh, as well, both the the opinion and the, and the framework that is explaining everything. Uh, then, of course, robustness and transparency is extremely important. Uh, first of all, because it's linked to incentive plans inside Schneider, so there is absolutely no way that we would. Um, uh, provide bonus to people on data that's not robust and audited, uh, especially that also until now, uh, that was also linked to long-term incentive plans, which is a, an, in the form of performance shares. Uh, on that, we've changed the tool for um, a new tool using external uh, ratings, but that's another, another topic. Um, so of course we audit that every year, that's part of our overall verification work. So we have, each year, external verifier auditing our data on environmental performance, um, social performance, uh, societal as well, and all the KPIs of the Schneider Sustainability Impact, which is our tool. And that ensures the robustness as well as quarterly publications. So you can imagine that when we put together figures, put them out every quarter, and that our CFO or CEO has to present them <laughs> to the public, um, you know, you have to pay attention to what you're doing. So then you have the whole process inside, uh, the tool that is de deployed, whatever controls uh, you can set as well. Fantastic, yeah, these are the accountability mechanisms. And I think, you know, your point about in the incentive structures and in the, the structures of actually presenting these findings, that, that's a very strong way to in increase that incentive. So thank you very much for that. Now uh, we're running out of time, but I'm, I'm going to pass the mic to each speaker really quickly to wrap up. But before we do that, I'm going to go over to the Slido one more time and we're just going to open the last piece that I'm going to come back to after our speakers have a chance to say their final word, which is just care, just to share one word that describes what you're taking away from this session. So uh, I'll give you, I'll let you do that while we hear from each of the last speakers. So I'll just close that. It's it's running now. You can enter and I'll come back to it in a second. So I'm going to start with David. You know, this is just the final word, the final sentence. What would you have people take away when it comes to gender lens investing? What are you taking away from this? 
Yes, I mean, I just want to emphasize, I mean, just some of the points I mentioned earlier. So, I mean, uh, uh, we are move, moving uh, like from 40 trillion US, US dollars in sustainable investments to 160 trillion. So, so I think there is a huge opportunity there to actually uh, just to scale up gender financing. So I would definitely advocate uh, that gender should be part of every newish, newly issued sustainable bond uh, or, or every new start uh, of, of like ESG funds, you know, and uh, because it just makes sense, you know, it has, you know, it should be like carbon, uh, like carbon footprint, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like now I just, you know, just working in sustainable finance, I see that it's, 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 it's becoming default, it's becoming just like the starting point for many of these ESG funds. So I, I mean, I want to see the same for gen gender, uh, so. Perfect. Thanks, David. Christine. Thanks. Yeah, I think gender lens investing is just good investing. and It's just good business. Um, I think we all have a unique role to play, um, both as investors and consumers. And, you know, we welcome you to start or continue on your journey to figure out what role you can play um, similar to, to what we've done at Alpha Mindy. Perfect. Thanks, Christine. Frederick. Yeah, thanks. And uh, for my last word, I'd like to answer a question that was actually on the chat I find very good what were the three must have uh, to go on this journey? And I think the first one is leadership buy-in. Uh, if our CEO and full XCOM and board were not behind the company to push us, we would not be where we are. So that's the number one. The second is the company culture, uh, very important as well. Uh, and the governance, you know, to embark all members of the company into the journey. And the last one is to accept to take risks because you know, there is no sustainability if you're not ambitious, take risk, be bold. And even sometimes you don't have the solution on how to achieve your goal. You know what's the right thing to do and where to go. Um, and you need to, to take some risk sometimes. <laughs> Perfect. I think that's a fantastic message. Uh, we're not going to get there if we don't step out of our comfort zone a little bit. Suzanne. I love what others had to share. And I'll, I'm going to double click on whether you're using an intentional gender strategy to start or whether you're using an integrated gender strategy as part of all ESG or all investments, there is a pathway. Um, and to be specific about, you know, what kind of capital you have to deploy into what kinds of instruments, what kinds of instruments to really what kinds of targets um, to recognize that it is not only about what we're investing in, but who is doing the investing and what is our investment process. How are we holding each other accountable? How are we really thinking about power relationships and dynamics in the, in the process? Uh, and really the power of the and, not the or. So that intersectionality uh, that we've been talking about, gender and climate and gender and uh, you know, the supply chains and gender and care economy, all of the ways that things come together and to think about um, just where the leadership is uh, to move this forward. So. Thank you so much for giving us this platform to share with you. And I loved hearing from our fellow panelists. Thank, thank you, Suzanne. And thank you all of you for, for these fantastic closing comments. I think that was a perfect way to sum up. And let's see what people are saying here. So we're seeing that women are the future. People are inspired. In a, okay, some hypocrisy. So we have a, a little bit of a, always, there's always a little bit of uh, tension in these topics as well. A journey, just do it, intensify, fairness, leadership, hopeful. I think those those really do uh, cover a lot of, of what we saw today. Um, and I'm going to leave this up if anyone wants to keep doing this because we'll include this with uh, you know some of these summaries in our in our takeaways. And I'll just say for me, you know, this is a topic where I, I, I've known it's important and it's it's something that I want to be a champion for, but how, how you do it is always harder. And today I really learned we need to get specific. So we need to be very specific about, about where we're going. Uh, we need to have leadership, but everyone also has a, a, a role to play. Uh, and then we need to take risks and we need to step out of our comfort zone and that we can do this either as a singular strategy or as something integrated within a broader picture of sustainability. And for me, those are things that I, think now I can take forward and I hope you can as well. So I just wanted to thank you all so much. First of all, our speakers, thank you so much. That was fantastic. I learned a ton. I'm sure that means that our, our audience did as well. And I know by the Q and A they did. And just wanted to thank everyone who was involved in putting on this future of finance series. 
Uh, we covered a lot in the last three days in just, you know, just over three hours of time. I think there was a lot of big ideas that came out. And just to, to say that we will be posting these um, uh, summary videos as well as summary blog posts. So if you want to learn more information, there'll be links to things in there and, and there's lots of places to keep going. So please continue to follow along with IISD and the China Council's journey in this space. And thank you again so much for being here and have a great rest of your day wherever in the world you may be. Thanks everyone.